All right, here we go. Week nine is in the books, and we are back here with you on another episode of Move the Sticks, presented by Old El Paso. What's up, friends? Great to be back here with you. Rhett Lewis, Bucky Brooks, Daniel Jeremiah, still on route back from MetLife Stadium, where let's just say offense was challenging last night between the Jets and the Chargers and let's kick this thing off here Bucky by getting to our Monday night football recap presented by old El Paso and you know let's just say the Paso abilities are not endless for the Jets offense Um, they are in fact very minimal and if it's not Garrett Wilson in the past game um it, it feels like it's not working and they couldn't even run the ball last night either. Offensive line struggled. And I felt like we wasted a really good defensive effort. Yeah. If you're Robert Solomon, you, 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 you just upset because this is a game where defensively you played well enough to give yourself a chance to win. Offensively, you couldn't get it going. Uh, you couldn't run the ball. You, you turned it over three times in the first quarter. Didn't give yourself a chance. Gave up a big punt return for a touchdown, which normally equates to losing. Uh, in, in the passing game, Zach Wilson didn't have enough time to really make plays. So we can't even really talk about is he or isn't he. He didn't have a chance because he always had a defender sitting in his lap. Uh, just a bad performance, a poor performance from a, a Jets offense that is still trying to figure out who they are, what they are, and how they can get it done, uh, just underperform on a major stage. And, and I think that's that's a good point. And, and to be fair, you know, the Jets' offensive line, which, you know, at full strength is, you know, probably not amongst the best in the league. But when it's not at full strength and missing, you know, two, three starters, Vera Tucker out, Beckton had to kick over to left tackle like he had the last couple of weeks. Man, it was trouble. You know, you had Tuli Tuli Peloto with two sacks, Bosa with two, Khalil Mack with two, the turnovers, the strip sacks. Now, the one thing that Zach Wilson can do, and if you were watching the Manning cast last night, you know, Peyton was, let's just say, very frustrated with the ball security within the confines of the pocket, Bucky. And and that does go back to fundamentals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it goes back to fundamentals. And he's always been a guy that is more of a gunslinger um, when it comes to the way that he played the position. If we do it in basketball terms, he's more of a scorer than a natural shooter. He finds a way to get baskets, but it's not always textbook. The thing about that, when you have someone who is very loose with the football and very loose in how he plays with Zach Wilson, hard to build a game plan, how to build a playbook around him. And if you're not good enough up front to keep everyone at bay and you don't have the weapons on the outside where you can win a bunch of one-on-one matchups, it just makes his life tough because he's trying to buy time, escape, run around, keep the plays alive until someone can uncover. But it takes a long time for these guys to uncover. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, like even on that last, you know, the the second to last drive, the last drive, you're just popping those check downs to Michael Carter, you know, like they're going out of style. And, you know, you just, they're just, they, there wasn't those explosive plays that they really needed. Uh, it certainly felt like. And then, you know, on the flip side, you know, the Jets aren't the only one, you know, that, that can wear something offensively here in this one. Justin Herbert did not have a Herbert like performance here. He was barely over 50% completion in this game. Um, and this Chargers offense now has not quite performed the way that we expected it to, you know, and, and at times it has certainly, but, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks, it's been a little different. Yeah, look, it, it's been a lot different for the Chargers team because now what is happening, uh, the tape on the Chargers has circulated around the league before early in the year you were trying to piecemeal what Kellen Moore likes to do from his time at Dallas and what Justin Herbert likes to do from his time being in the league with the Chargers. Now we have enough evidence of watching these two work together. Teams are beginning to understand the concepts they like, uh, any tendencies that may show up um, when they're beginning to study both of these, uh, these guys, and they're beginning to have a great understanding of the personnel that's at his disposal. Uh, is Keenan Allen able to go? If he is Allen, you know, what does he provide? What does Mike Williams do? How are they going to use Quentin Johnson? And it goes down a list. They have performed better against the Chargers because they have a better understanding of how they want to play. And because they have that understanding, they're beginning to make calls that really disrupts the way the Chargers want to play. 
So when we look at this now, with both of these teams sitting at four and four, uh, the Chargers obviously with the with the win in this one, twenty seven to six, move into the tenth spot in the AFC. So both teams definitely still on the outside looking in, but it's pretty clear, you know, you'd have more confidence in what the Chargers are able to do right now because of the quarterback situation. Whereas we heard again, uh, what was it, post game or pre game, um, you know. Guys going up to Aaron Rodgers, hey, when, oh, it was Derwin James after the game comes up and and says, hey, you know, when, when are we going to see you again? He says, you know, look, a few weeks, which again would be crazy. But at this point, you know, when when does it become like a lost cause for the Jets and for Aaron Rodgers to try to get this thing back? And can they hold serve now based on what we're seeing uh, with this offensive line, with Zach Wilson, you know, when they can't have it going on offense the way they need to? Well, look, I, I think it, it is probably situation critical. You probably have about four weeks before he yeah. has to go into the mix. You got to give him a chance to have an impact on the game. And the biggest impact he's going to have is he'll win the one that he's playing, he'll win the next one. And then you're hoping that the league does you a solid and some guys kind of come back to the pack. Um, it's a really interesting situation, scenario, when, when we look at this team and how this team wants to, to get down. But Look, it's going to take a while for the Jets to kind of get back on top, and they're going to need more than Aaron Rodgers coming back. They're going to need the defense to play like the first-team defense and the second-team offense where they're scoring points on these hidden phases of the game. Offensively, they won't be able to score enough points to get it done. So just looking at the next uh, couple of games here for the Jets, uh, they're going to go to Las Vegas on Sunday night football uh, to take on, you know, a – Definitely new look Raiders team with uh, Antonio Pierce running the show there at head coach. Then they got to go to Buffalo to take on the Bills. Look, the Bills have been up and down this year, but certainly capable of uh, of winning that game. And then the Dolphins, you know, um, w- with the explosive ability that they have, can can the Jets score enough points to keep pace there? And then Atlanta, Houston, and Miami again. Um, so if, if you're talking about you know mid December mm-hmm. as as a potential spot for Aaron Rodgers to come back. I mean, you've at least got to win three of your next five, it feels like, to have a shot. And so uh, we'll see if the Jets can ultimately get that done. Okay, let's move it on here as we get to our rookie draft. And boy, Bucky, um, oh, boy. you know, you got shit out. The, the old goose egg. Shit out. Uh, not great for you there, pal. <laughs> but, um, you know, the good news is you guys decided at the last second to bring back the quarterbacks into the mix. And, you know, clearly I was rolling with my guy, CJ Stroud. So that got me the three. We talked about that on the pod on Monday. Jordan Addison also gets me three from the receiver spot. Um, so, you know, I'm just curious because obviously I wasn't here last mm. week, Bucky. How did DJ, mm-hmm. did DJ really appreciate my nine point outing uh, from last week that now has me all the way up at number two, two points behind him in the standings? Did, I just wanted to know, did he appreciate that fully? Um, he didn't. He didn't appreciate it. But much like Big Ten officials are trying to figure out what to do with Michigan, I am trying to figure out what to do with you with these late ads, these clandestine oh, texts that are going to oh, Drew, wow. where he's picking guys that are maybe on or off the board, and we, you know we're kind of stealing signs along the way. So we're just trying to figure wow. out how all of a sudden Rhett, who was last, is really close the gap and it's close to being first. I just don't understand like some of the new rules that are kind of in play because I thought we talking about quarterbacks one one week then quarterbacks are not on the board but then they're back on the board just need clarity just clarity and consistency yeah. so we can play within the rules and kind of figure out a way to be able to get it right well look as a as a you know as a really good you know head football coach uh like you are uh Bucky I mean you know you got to be flexible and you got to be willing to figure out a way to maximize your team's mm-hmm. ability and that's what I think has ultimately been lacking for you these last couple of weeks. I, I have no doubt you're going to get get things back yeah. on track. It just might be uh, too little, too late. But the good news is, Buck, that you do have <laughs> the first pick in this in this week's draft. So it's going to go uh, Bucky, and then it's going to come to me, and then producer Drew. 
uh, has DJ's uh, pre-rankings of his rookies for this week. And so we uh, we will get DJ back-to-back picks at three and four, and then it'll swing back and snake as it usually does. So this is what we're doing this week. We're going quarterback. We're going running back. And then you have the choice on the pass catcher, can go receiver or tight end. So there you go. Yeah, no. Uh, it's, so that's it's where tough. we're at. And let's yeah, just get I mean, let's get the buys out here, Bucky, and just make sure we're all on the same page here. No Puka Nakua this week. The Rams uh, are on a buy. And let's see who else is on the buy. We've got the Dolphins on a buy, the Chiefs, and the Eagles. So, wow, some star power uh, on the sidelines here this week in Week 10. Mm-hmm. All right, Bucky, you are up. Pick number one of the draft. Where are you headed? Well, I'm going to go with the biggest star in the league right now, uh, the run, the young C.J. Stroud will now come on the team, B.B., and he'll try and help me get out of this rut, much like he's helped the Tennessee Titans get out of their rut following Deshaun Watson's mess. They have come, and they're playing better because C.J. Stroud is look, dealing. He's dealing from the pocket. You have a lot of confidence that he's always going to keep your team in the mix. Well, I'm going to bestow that same confidence on him. He is going to help me climb out the cellar and get back to being a very, very competitive team. Okay, so that brings me up here at number two. So Bucky going with Stroud, uh, certainly a good choice there with the number one pick. Now, this is kind of interesting here because there's some tough matchups this week. Stroud going against the Bengals, by the way. Tough defense in Lou Anarumo over there. There's any number of rookies that could uh, ultimately (laughs) end up starting this week, although I think Clayton Toon is down. And so uh, Kyler Murray is going to start for the Cardinals this week. Uh, I'm not going to go with Aiden O'Connell against this Jets defense. I'm not sure I'm ready for that one just yet. Um, So as we go with the quarterbacks, I kind of feel like the way that C.J. Stroud carved up the Bucs defense last week, I might want to go Will Levis here with the Tennessee Titans uh, going to Tampa here in Week 10. Um, Or Mm -hmm. do I go back and get my running back? Um, You know what? I think ultimately – that's where I'm headed here. I'm gonna go. Um, yeah. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go and get Bijan. Give me Bijan back here, okay? Bijan is getting mm. back into the swing of things against a one and eight Cardinals team. Give me Bijan Robinson at pick number two. So Drew, who we got for DJ at three? So DJ is gonna go with Jameer Gibbs at three. Mm. Oh, and then he's going Levis. I thought I might be able to sneak it. All right, so. It's going to go Stroud, Bijan, and then DJ with his back-to-back picks takes Jameer Gibbs and Will Levis. Uh, Levis, the quarterback. Mm. So he's got his running back and quarterback, just needs his pass catcher with the last pick of the draft. So it comes back to me now, pick number five, and I am going to – I don't need to take my quarterback, and I can take my choice of the first uh, wide receiver or tight end off the board, and I'm going to go with Tank Dell. Give me Tank Dell, who was outstanding last week for the Houston Texans caught the game winner from CJ Stroud in addition to another touchdown. So tank Dell uh, is my pick, which brings you back up here, Bucky with a couple in a row, two picks in a row for you. Yeah. Two picks in a row. So I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm sitting here contemplating who can I go, who can help me get back on track. And so I'm going to just go and I'm going to try and figure out if Jordan Addison can, can, can get something done. I know Josh Dobbs is coming in. Okay. They didn't talk to each other, but they somehow find a way to make some connections. So, I will take him as my pass catcher. The tougher thing is trying to figure out who to be my my runner. Jameer Gibbs is off the board. I'm looking. I'm scrolling. I'm sitting here. Um, <laughs> the clock, the clock not, is running. <laughs> not, a, not, not a lot of options. So I think what I'm going to do is, because the Broncos come back, I think I'm going to gamble on Jaleel. McLaughlin and see if he comes back okay. following the bye. If they can come back and get me back on track. How about that? Against the Bills defense. Okay. So that means uh I need my there's quarterback. Light, so there's light in the pants. Uh yikes. So I'm gonna go with Bryce Young as my quarterback. Um going up against the Bears. I feel like that's gonna be a, a nice bounce back for Bryce who threw a couple of picks, three picks really in this matchup uh, his last game. Mm. So Bryce Young is going to be my pick. And then DJ, to close it out, is going to go back to the well with Dalton Kincaid, who I think he's got in the last couple of weeks. Mm. So he so he is the only tight end in the mix this week, even with Sam Laporta back against the Chargers. But uh, DJ is going with Dalton Kincaid with the final pick 
uh, for the Bills against the Broncos on Monday night football. So there you have it. From C.J. Stroud to Dalton Kincaid, uh, we've got it working uh, right there. Okay, so that's a look at some of the offensive rookies we like when we come back here on Move the Sticks. Going to turn the tables to the defensive side of the ball and look at some of those rookie edge rushers, check in where they are at now just past the halfway point of this season. All right, Red Lewis, Bucky Brooks, back here with you on Move the Snakes. Time for sacks and quarterbacks, presented by Campbell's. All right, let's take a look at your 2023 mm. first-round edge rusher types here from this last year's draft. As you look at total pressures right now per po- uh, per pro football focus, there it is. Uh, Will Anderson is far and away the leader of the pack here. The third overall pick uh, has 28 pressures right now. Tyree Wilson and Lucas Van Ness up there, as well as Felix Enyedike Uzama was the last pick uh, of the first round. But there's some interesting kind of nuggets to get into with each one of these guys. And, and let's start diving into it now here, Bucky. And look, let's start at the top because we we talked a lot about C.J. Stroud early in the week here on Move the Sticks, uh, mm-hmm. and rightly so. I mean, we might be talking about not only rook, Offensive Rookie of the Year, but like this guy that might be inserting himself into the MVP conversation here with the way that he has played. Uh, but let's on on the flip side, Will Anderson, I think, has been you know more quietly delivering right on the defensive side with the mm-hmm. pressures that he has. He's playing anywhere between forty and fifty five snaps right now, Bucky. So he is a huge part of the Texans defensive effort. They rely on him uh, to, you know, really bring the effort and bring the pressure. And and he's been doing, you know, a really good job in run, run support as well. So he's kind of been the complete player for them. And, and he is much more than a rotational player, like some of these other rookies. So that's maybe why the numbers are a bit skewed. Yeah. The numbers are skewed because he's looked really, really productive. You talk about, he has 28 pressures and that slowest guy has seven. Uh, that's significant because he also plays for a really good team. A good team will give you opportunities to hunt the quarterback. When you look at the other guys, some of them are on losing teams, so you don't get as many opportunities to get in that track stance and go hunt the quarterback off the edge. The Niners have had the, 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 the fortune of being able to play in front, which will create and has created, not the Niners, the Texans have yeah. played in more yeah. games, but they've won, so it's given them opportunities to like get after it. And so that's why you've seen Will Anderson. But let's talk about him and his football character. As much as everyone will laud C.J. Stroud about being the franchise guy and what he's brought to the team, Will Anderson has done that on the other side. He and some of his Alabama teammates have gotten together. They just talk about like their winning pedigree, their attitude, being able to come in and do those things. So as good as he is as a pass rusher, he's been worth his weight in gold in terms of the leadership qualities that he has kind of given this defense. One of the reasons why the Houston Texans have bounced up off the mat quicker than we expected, C.J. Stroud on offense, but Will Anderson absolutely getting the job done on defense. I mean, he's got such a sh- like such power. Like his initial his initial contact with offensive linemen, or if you dare, tight ends, creates such a shock, and you can just see it with the way that he generates that force, and it, it knocks guys back almost immediately. So Will Anderson and C.J. Stroud, I mean, just a phenomenal haul for the Houston Texans right now, not to mention what Tank, Tank Dell's doing uh, as a third-round pick. Let's move on here down the list. Um, I, I'll, I'll come to you here on, on Tyree Wilson, Bucky, because... I, you know, the seven pressures, he's definitely been getting more reps as the season has mm-hmm. gone on. Obviously missed a lot of the uh, off season in the summer with injury, but started to started to work his way back here. I, I just think like ultimately the Raiders need more. Like they need more from Tyree Wilson because Max mm-hmm. Crosby gives you max effort on every snap, takes no reps off. So you got to get something else from someone else. And that person is Tyree Wilson. How do they unlock that in Las Vegas? Yeah, now they have to find a way to to really unlock it. And it's one of the things that uh, AP Antonio Pierce will will try to do. They'll try and find a way to put the young guy in situations where he can thrive and flourish and those things. But one thing I do know, and listening to Pierce talk to his team, talk to everybody around Raider Nation and pressers, Tyree Wilson is going to have to earn the opportunity. It's not just going to be given to him because he's the first-round pick. He is going to have to play and show them in short stints that he deserves more time. So a lot of this is on him. And when you go back and you look at him at Texas Tech, look, big-time flasher. You are smitten with the potential and what he could be, but 
didn't necessarily put it together to the same level of consistency um, that Anderson did that we talked about for the yeah. Texans. This guy needs to splash. He needs to make some splash plays because what will happen if he makes a splash play or two, he'll earn more opportunities to get after the passer. But it starts with him. He has to be productive in a limited, uh, a limited amount of reps so he can earn the right to have more opportunities to get after the quarterback. Moving down the line here a little bit, Lucas Van Ness is a name that I feel like just has gone, you know, totally untalked about uh, for the majority of this season with the Green Bay Packers. You know, it was a first round pick, obviously, here and just ha has not generated mm -hmm. that type of buzz. Um, he actually, I think, play might have played his best game in his first game, week one, in that rivalry game against the Chicago Bears, played a ton of snaps, using him as kind of that stand-up right outside linebacker. Now, obviously, he's got to fight for snaps, too, and fight for reps with Preston Smith and with Rashawn Gary, and you know, that's obviously a little bit difficult there. Um, but he had five pressures, and his first NFL sack comes in that first game, and then you know, the reps started to come off a little bit. So he wasn't getting as many mm -hmm. opportunities, but then he kind of started to ramp back up here a little bit. I think what you're seeing here with Lucas Van Ness is what we saw in the pre-draft process. The strength and the athleticism and the physicality is all there in spades. And, and when he's winning, that's ultimately what he's winning with. I think as you get more seasoning for a young player like that, and you can continue to work on your craft, um, I, I think you'll start to see that unlock. I, I wouldn't be shocked if, if Lucas Van Ness comes back next year and starts, you know, a breakout type of campaign uh, early on next season. I think he's going to continue to get better. He's just got all the tools, just got to be able to put it together on a consistent basis. As we head to Germany once again this week, set your alarm. Sunday morning football back for an encore in Frankfurt exclusively on NFL Network. You can watch with the world as... And a Tommy Wilde, Abari, and the Colts face off against the Patriots. Rise, shine, and watch on Sunday, November 12th, 9.30 a.m. Eastern Time, only on NFL Network and streaming on NFL+. Plus. Artist time now for Road Warriors, presented by Courtyard by Marriott. Let's talk Colts, Patriots in Germany on NFL Network and streaming on NFL+. Plus. Certainly feels like two teams trending in the opposite direction. Colts get a big win this past week. Patriots, another loss. And a loss that generated questions from the assembled media in Foxborough mm -hmm. on Monday directed towards Bill Belichick about his job security. Holy smokes, what world are we living in right now where Bill Belichick is fielding those types of questions? But look, the record speaks for itself. It is not up to the Patriots' standard. Do they find a way off U.S. soil to rekindle some of that Patriot magic here, Bucky, or are we just done at this point? No, I think they found a way to get it done against the Indianapolis Colts. Part of the reason is because Bill Belichick will find a way to make life miserable for Garner Minshew in the pocket, despite the superiority uh, when it comes to their, their talent, uh, even the level of physicality that the Colts play with right now compared to the, the Patriots. This is one that the game is still decided by the play of the quarterback. I cannot in good faith think that Garner Minshew is going to find a way to kind of crack the code and just unlock and unleash uh, passes to the tune of 300 yards. To me, this is a close game because the Patriots make it a close game and then they find a way to steal it at the end. And, and, you know, you just kind of wonder what kind of chess game is Shane Steichen want to play with the game plan here against Bill Belichick. If, if he's worried about what Belichick can do to Gardner Minshew in the pocket, does this kind of become, you know, one of those, let's say, old school Tennessee Titan with Ryan Tannehill games or one of those old school uh, Jimmy Garoppolo with the 49ers games where they just take the air out of the football and run the rock with Jonathan mm -hmm. Taylor and Zach Moss. And you just try to find a way to, you know, shorten the game, keep the thing close, find a way to win it late. Um, I, I don't know. I, I could certainly see that happening with, I mean, because that's clearly still the strength of this football team, even though, you know, Michael Pittman Jr., Josh Downs, when he's healthy and, and you know, they've proven that they can, they can move the ball through the air. But I just, I just wonder if you take the risk out of this thing against the Patriots team that showed very little on offense and just try to try to dominate the clock and dominate the game that way um, with that group. Wouldn't be surprised on that one, Bucky. No, I wouldn't be surprised. And, and, and here's the thing when, when we, when we look at this matchup and um, look, those two guys were right amongst the top 15 players in this game. Uh, Jonathan Taylor, yep. Zach Moss collectively are being able to get it done. We talk about a, a running, a rushing attack, completely turning around when, when guys show up. So these guys can make life tough 
on the Patriots. And if they're committed to running the football because they want to protect Garner Minshew, yeah, this game will go into the fourth quarter, being within one score. But then it comes a matter of who do you trust, who you count on, who do you lean on in those yeah. moments. I'm going to go with the Bengals. Like, I'm going to go on the other side in a tough one just because I think the Patriots find a yeah. way to continue to confound Garner Minshew, okay. and that's ultimately the deciding factor. But for Bucky Brooks, I'm Rhett Lewis. Thanks for being with us here on Move the Sticks.